nine coaches will combine for 286 wins and 274 losses. And two of those teams, 1917 and 1919, which were coached by Z.G. Clevenger, a terrific coach, those teams will win conference championships with the old Missouri Valley Conference. Uh, so K-State at that time, basketball, there were some great moments, there were some pretty good teams, and there were a lot of bad teams. Our team uh, over the three years, we were probably about a 50-50 uh, uh, level of accomplishment as far as uh, won or lost uh, games. There was no time limit on the courts. The scoring of the game was somewhere between 20 to 45 points. It was very unusual that 50 points was accomplished. As a matter of fact, looking at my uh, uh, yearbooks, I only found one instance where our team uh, scored 50 points or a few more. Gardner comes in 1939, he's 29 years old, he's the youngest coach in the country. He comes to K-State in that summer of 39. K-State is a college at that time. It has an enrollment of 4,090 students. He immediately senses a kind of a complacency. K-State is content at being everybody's little brother. And Gardner quickly announced to anybody who would listen, that's the old K-State basketball. It doesn't reside in the Flint Hills anymore. I was in the athletic office one day in uh... Jack Gardner walks in, he'd just been released from service, Lieutenant Commander, uh, blue Navy uh, uniform, and uh, he was smoking like mad and ashes all over his Navy blue suit. He had a bunch of us out of the service, people like me, uh, that uh, were coming in to play for him. He ran a huge camp. I can't remember how many were in that camp, something like 60 or 70. Now that camp, he, he gleaned some more players. And so he had a nucleus of all veteran players. Because of the uh, immense interest of the students and, and uh, at that time, and the records before, I suppose you'd say that might have been the, the uh, start of it of something really good. Yes, we felt a deep sense of starting something big. Because, you know, I don't know in history if we ever had the kind of year that we had in, at that time. Everybody wanted to see Jack Gardner's Wildcats because they were fun to watch. They were different. And so Nichols Gymnasium becomes packed. And it's Gardner's teams coupled with Mike Ahern, the athletic director, who will finally steamroll K-State towards getting the necessary money from the legislature to build a new field house. My senior year, uh, they opened Ahern Fieldhouse and, and what, a, what a tremendous facility. The way at that particular time it wasn't completed, they had the apex on each end of, uh, of Ahern still not completed, they had to put up tarpaulins and everything to keep the weather out. During the 38 year period that, that Ahern was the home of K-State basketball, K-State won more conference championships, Big 7, Big 8 championships, than any other school in the conference, including the school just a little ways down I-70 to the east. More, K more conference championships were won by K-State during that period than anybody else. We didn't play any place else that, that had any kind of uh, enthusiasm that would match what we were used to here. I mean, it would have been intimidating and it would have been um, difficult to play in such a place. There was no place like that. First uh, game of my senior year was in Ahern. The place was just really uh, full of people and, and uh, a big crowd. I don't remember how many there was in there, but I, I do remember that I think that our team that year had the highest attendance at home and when we played on the road of any team in the country that year. That team, 50-51, that Ernie played on, Ernie and Jim Iverson and Bob Rousey and Lou Hitch and Jack Stone and Eddie Head, uh, I tell you, that's one of the best basketball teams uh, anybody could coach. The Cats were on a roll as they went into the playoffs, and uh, it's the Oklahoma A&M game. In the semifinal game, it's a brutal game physically. And of course, that's where Ernie got 
the uh, busted shoulder. But uh, he was, and it wound up being very ineffective because he just, he was crippled, really. And you know, we had to go to Minneapolis to play for the championship a few days after that. We'd have won that if Ernie wouldn't have been hurt because he couldn't raise his arm up, he couldn't hardly shoot, so uh, I really think we'd have won the national championship that year. 57-58 Final Four team as another uh, team that probably should have won the national championship. When I think about that ball club, I think about uh, a team that had a lot of talent and had a great desire uh, to win. Uh, I think that uh, personally I have not known of a group of players who were so intense and so committed uh, to each other and to the coach and to winning. If it wasn't for Jack having the situations that developed in Louisville, Kentucky, there's no question in my mind we would have won it all. The 57-58 team probably had five of the greatest players in the history of Kansas State basketball. Uh, Jack Parr, no doubt in my mind, was the best center. Bob Boozer is probably the best forward ever to play. And Wally Frank, as I've said, is probably the most underrated basketball player of the bunch. I really think we had 58-59 team was probably better. We played better together than we did in 57-58. In 58-59 team, which ended the regular season number one in the country, had only lost uh, one game that year in the regular season. They didn't get to the Final Four, but uh, you could maybe make an argument that they were better than the 57-58 team. It's really uh, a shame we didn't get to the Final Four. I think we could have won it. But uh, through the years, I've, I've learned you have to be good and you have to be lucky to, to win a national championship. But that was a special team. Tex was a great coach, great young coach. And he could, he could relate to each of the ball players and you know, each ball player had their own style, their own temperament, and Tex was a molder. He molded all those things together and made us a very, very cohesive, cohesive group of, of ball players. What I knew about Tex, I was not disappointed with. He was exactly as he portrayed himself, a very straightforward, uh, what he said was the way it would be, and that's the way it was. He always had good humor. Uh, we could tease him. He had a reputation of being a lousy dresser. He probably uh, still has that. Uh, so in fact, there were a couple of times where uh, uh, I think we got some of the ugliest ties that we could ever find on a road trip. And when we got back home, uh, tic tac them uh, to, the, uh, to the dressing room door of the uh, coaches. And I believe he wore one of those things <laughs> on one of the next uh, games or uh, our next trips that we were at. So, uh, uh, Tech's a great guy, he's still a great guy, and he, uh, uh, you know, the king of basketball. Later on, Willie Morrell, uh, we did recruit, did see play in junior college, he was junior college All-American. I think one of, the, one of the best players that K-State's ever had, uh, particularly out of junior college. The first year, uh, junior college transfer is kind of rough, but that second year he blossomed into an All-American, really. And that 64 team, K-State's last Final Four team, a lot of people don't remember that. Uh, I was pretty young at the time, uh, but Willie Morrell is probably the one K-Stater I would most, I would pay to go back and watch play. Uh, I don't want to say he single-handedly carried K-State to the 64 Final Four, but he was largely instrumental. In 1967, uh, Tex hired Cotton Fitzsimmons to take my place, and then after a year Tex left to go to Washington, Cotton did a great job. And, Cotton was very dynamic. Cotton was probably more of a PR guy, obviously, than Tex was. Tex was more about staying in the office and diagramming the X's and O's. Cotton was a, a people person, wanted to go out and shake hands, and was a great lead recruiter for Tex Winter for all those years. Cotton brought a lot of great energy to the program, and if I remember right, Cotton was the one who came up with the uh, different colored socks that they wore. And uh, that kind of shook people up a little bit, but uh, they were colorful, and, and that kind of fit Cotton's persona to be a very colorful person. Cotton loved to play the, the fast-paced game. I mean, uh, the last game he ever coached at K-State was the uh, third-place game in the regional, and they beat Houston 107 to 98. So that's probably why he got an NBA job because uh, he was kind of playing an NBA style of pace. Players loved playing for him because uh, he didn't stop stop him from running up and down the court. When I was athletic director, 
I had the chance to recruit Jack Hartman. He was one of three coaches that I had selected. I had heard about him when I visited Oklahoma State uh, out of high school. That first year was pretty tough. They, uh, Jack was, if a kid didn't do what he was supposed to do, he was gone and then there was, you know, that happened. And so people weren't too happy that first year. <laughs> but by the end of the year, it was okay. Jack's greatest move that summer was he went over to Silver Lake and signed Lon Kruger, which was the dream player for, for Jack Hartman. Terrific coach, just uh, always so well prepared, very organized, uh, competed like crazy, you know, every day in practice, preparation for every game. Uh, again, just other than my parents, probably the guy in, in my life that had the, the greatest impact and uh, uh, can have a higher level of respect than, than what I have for coach. The environment at that time, I think, was at its highest. It was wonderful. Everybody was into to basketball. The community was, uh, it was just a big uplift for everybody. And they all had one thing in common, that they loved Kansas State basketball. They loved being a part of that tradition over there, and they loved camping out in cold weather. There was a, a, a badge of honor to sleep out there in the cold and wait in line for a week or whatever it took. They see that with Duke, and I tell people, listen, we were doing that at K-State back in the 70s. They have nothing on us. Krzyzewskiville, I think the weather can be bad in the wintertime, but nothing like Manhattan, Kansas, with the wind and the cold and the sleet and the, the few fans out there. And then have the little space heaters that have their little um, uh, bed rolls all laid out and you'd go in and some guys would have complete, complete refrigeration systems in there for food the whole week. And what they would do was they would go in groups. Let's say there was a tent, there were eight guys in this tent. You'd have two, 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 and they would go to their classes and the other guys would uh, watch the facility. The other six might go to their classes and then they'd kind of rotate. But they would be there throughout, and there was a long line, particularly for Kansas University games, games against Missouri, where they would camp out and they would rush the floor. When they opened the, uh, that door, and it was like a herd of cattle, it'd be like, the, like that uh, scene you see in Spain when they have the annual bull, <laughs> where they, I guess the bulls chase the people and they're all over and they're, you know, grabbing. Uh, that's kind of how it was. It, you just like open the gate and here they come. The goosebumps that I get just talking about it. I mean, I talked to Tim Jankovich and Tim was playing in the game against Indiana. And the first play of the game, offensively, uh, K-State had, they ran a backdoor play for a, for a dunk. And like I said, I, I remember the noise. The, the, Tim said he felt like going back, defensively he had very little control. It was like the the noise was moving him. You know, I think there are places, you know, all the small towns where players are from, where people are from, that's the entertainment, are their high school sports. So they know more about the game. That made them an intelligent audience. You could feel that, you know, that they knew what had happened on the floor or with an official or, or with just a player. They knew, they, they had a, a knowledge that was good. You know, we had the most popular shoe in the country to go with those lavender uniforms. KMAN did its own pregame show with Coach Hartman that I did. So I lugged a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder into his office every morning of the ball game and, and did the five-minute blurb. And uh, the one morning I went in there and there's that color combination laying on the, de on the desk, uh, the jersey. And he said, uh, you can't say a word about this. I mean, he threatened me with my life not to say that this, this look was coming to Kansas State. He just said, what do you think? And I paused and said, well, it sure doesn't look like you. They were awesome. I mean, they were, they were so distinct K-State. I mean, they were, you knew who it was. You, you didn't have to look twice and go, who's that playing? You knew that was Kansas State out there. And it was, a, it was an odd combination of colors but it seemed to fit the time. And you know, on the 
front cover of SI, the Rolando shots in those two-tone jerseys. They probably aren't going to win any uh, fashion awards, but uh, I think the popularity was that uh, K-State had some really good teams when they wore them. Uh, but I, uh, I talked to Curtis Redding a year ago when I wrote a story about his years, his two years at K-State. And before I could even start the interview, Kurt, the first thing Curtis asked me was, hey buddy, where can you get me those uniform, uh, those retro uniforms? I've been looking all over the place for them. That's part of Ahern, that's part of Coach Hartman, that's part of, the, that's part of who we were. And uh, uh, you didn't see anybody else in the country at that time wear different colored uniforms. Whether it was a marketing ploy or not, it was something that was, that was us, it was unique to us. And uh, Coach Hartman was, was, in a lot of ways, was way ahead of his time. Jack Hartman was one of those guys that just didn't coach people, he coached coaches. And so he left a huge impression on uh, uh, Lon Kruger as well, as a coach. Uh, so I think as far as systems on the court, at least in the early years, you could see a lot of Jack Hartman in him and the way he wanted to construct a team. You know, some of the great teams of Jack Hartman's were led by Lon Kruger. Lon Kruger arrives, the first thing he does after his press conference is he goes to McPherson to get Steve Henson to come to Kansas State. Uh, and in many ways repeats history that way because all four years Kruger was here, uh, Henson was leading the way as his point guard. I was kind of having himself on the court. When I signed to play at K-State, you know, I just jumped in with both feet and tried to do everything he asked me to do. And uh, just had a great deal of confidence that everything he asked of me was to help me become a better person, better player, and, and was in turn going to help our team. Steve was the perfect guy for us. I mean, he competed really hard, and not just in games. I mean, every day in practice is exactly you know, what you see in games. And, and because of that, it, it, it carried over, and other players worked like that. And you know, to have Steve run the team was very comforting from a, from a coach's perspective, for sure. I think what made that group pretty special, we had a bunch of guys that just loved to play. And we played every night, you know, in the summers for, for hours and you couldn't get Mitch out of there, you couldn't get his roommate Charles Bloodsoe out of there, Will, Will Scott loved to play, uh, you know, heated games, intense games, guys got along, but Mitch, Mitch was, you know, from the second he got on campus was, was the, the leader, the rock of the team, not necessarily the vocal leader, but he was a guy that we knew, you know, he was the man, there was no question about it. What was the MVP of uh, an NBA All-Star game? Uh, he was a terrific scorer, a, a, an extraordinary competitor. Uh, he played to win. I'm grateful that he is part of, uh, of our tradition. K-State was as good as any basketball program in the country. They were recognized as a national power from really starting back with Jack Gardner through Tex and through Jack Hartman. Uh, Lon Kruger got him into an Elite Eight. I think at one time Kansas State ranked up there with any basketball program in the country. And if you travel with them and listen to other coaches talk about them, you realize other coaches and other people in basketball recognize Kansas State as a national power. Of course, we fell off quite a bit, especially after Lon Kruger left. And uh, not because of coaching, I just think we had a hard time getting some players in here. I think uh, the coaches we had, uh, Dana Altman, Woldridge, uh, Tom Asbury, uh, were fine coaches. It's just that times were just not right to bring the right people into play. I always tell younger people that uh, if, if you appreciate K-State football, just imagine K-State basketball having 40 years of that. And that's what happened with K-State basketball. And then, you know, after Coach Kruger's departure, it went dormant. Uh, it just kind of shriveled up and sat there on the shelf for a long time. Uh, other coaches had tried to bring it back, but it took the force of personality, you know, just that uh, incredible aura that Bob Huggins had to really bring it back. He brought it back not only in recruiting, uh, but he's a great coach. And, and like Jack Hartman, he had a plan and he was going to enforce that plan every step of the way, off the court, on the court, during games, during practice. Uh, and I think he laid a foundation for great things for this program uh, and in many ways ended that long winter time that K-State basketball had gone through and, and I think a lot of fans, even in his departure, felt like it's springtime again with K-State basketball. I think it was very exciting for, for all the former players and students and all the alumni, you know, it was, it was exciting to see that stuff, to see Bramlage build again, you know, and 
and to see people proud to, to wear that purple out there. And, and that just, I mean, that kind of happened, I think, the day that they hired Huggins, which was a great thing, I think, for all of us. And, you know, getting Beasley in there and all the excitement surrounding that. And, and now they've got a lot of good young players, so I think they're going in the right direction with that. Kansas State has a great basketball tradition. It, it may be a little bit stale, but, you know, if it can get rolling here with what Huggins started and Frank Martin can follow up, and the pieces are there to do so. We didn't get ranked the 22nd most successful college basketball program of all time. Not in the last 10 years, of all time. Uh, because we were a two-year wonder program. You know, it's, uh, uh, this school has had a, a lot, a lot of success for a lot of years. And, uh, you know, when you go in and you show people uh, the great coaches, the great players, the great winning tradition, uh, you know, the, the, everything that takes to, to build the, the, the great tradition that we have here. Uh, then people sit there and they say, oh, it can be done. And when you can show people that it can be done, then you, then you got a chance to get people to buy into your dream, to buy into what you're selling and, uh, and believe in it. And that's what we're trying to do. And the, the only way that, that it can be done is by K-State having the, the incredible tradition of coaches and players that it's had as a basketball program.